the FAIRS platform. And, uh, well, first of all, to say thanks thanks to all of you so much for being being a part of this and the unusual circumstances that we're in. It's, uh, it's hugely appreciated. Just a couple of... Uh, housekeeping matters. I don't need to say anything about the fire exits or the toilets this time <laughs> around. Uh, but one thing, one thing we are doing is we are going to close, we are going to caption these talks, but rather than use the Zoom software for it, we're going to send the talks to a company that'll do the, uh, do the captioning and then, then send them on. But that was just a request from the ICA. Uh, each presentation will be uh, 12 minutes. Uh, if you want to use uh, PowerPoints, uh, use the share screen function. Uh, we advise people to uh, mute their microphones uh, when not, not presenting. Also, just in terms of uh, chairing, what I'll do is I'll give notifications using the chat, the chat function. So I'll notify for five minutes, two minutes and time. And uh, that should allow us a good good period of time for discussion uh, after after the presentation. So, just before, and we'll go in the order uh, as listed of um, which was I believe Victor, Victor, uh, Sandra, Victor, Sandra, Yanru, and Dwayne. Okay. And I'll just, uh, just make a few observations on what uh, inspired us to run this uh, post-conference in the first place. And it was to address the significant change that had been identified in public and policy discussions around digital platforms over the course of the 2010s. So if we think about the 2010s, uh, the decade started with much talk about social media being heralded as bringing forth a new era of openness and collaboration ended with scandals such as Cambridge Analytica, concerns about disinformation and fake news, and the so-called tech lash against the perceived monopoly power of the largest digital platform companies. Associated with these changes has been the structural shift in media consumption towards content delivered through digital platforms, which has generated uh, crises for a number of traditional media industries and professions, most uh, notably, but by no means exclusively, news and journalism. So there have been a series of inquiries taking place around the world. Uh, the estimate from uh, uh, Dwayne Winsek and Manuel Puppis's work is that there are at least 50 uh, taking place around issues ranging from competition and copyright, bargaining relations with traditional media, content moderation standards, and other areas. And I think Beyond the content of these inquiries, it also marks a moment where nation states have become increasingly assertive around their position vis-a-vis -vis digital platform industries and digital content. What does it mean uh, to be in the age of COVID-19 in this regard? One observation I'd have is that digital platform companies are strengthening their relative economic position, that uh, if one looks at the Standard & Poor's and other indexes at the moment, uh, the big five tech companies have acquired a considerably more dominant role and increasingly appear as public utilities in an age of interconnected yet vulnerable citizens. And it seems to me the politics of this can go one of a couple of ways. So for reform advocates such as uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren in the US, uh, this period marks a moment where the public utility dimensions of big tech warrant stronger public interest regulations as well as the application of antitrust laws uh, requiring structural separation. On the other hand, I noted in uh, the Weekend Financial Times, the Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, describing the times of the pandemic as meaning, and I quote, the challenges we face demand an unprecedented alliance between business and government. So I'll leave that uh, for people to think about. At the same time, we note that there's a considerable lack of consensus about what digital platform could or should involve. So what are the different policy models that uh, we're considering here? I know that um, Dwayne's done work, work on this. The relationship between nation states and supranational models. Uh, the question of platform brokered arrangements themselves, such as the Facebook Oversight Board or Tim Berners-Lee contract for the web, substituting for nation state. Regulations, And finally, if that's not enough topics for us to consider, we have the uh, geopolitical dimensions of this, what's been referred to as the potential for a global splinter net, 
the Chinese digital ecosystem that's evolved largely independently of the dominant Western players and the relationship of the Chinese tech giants to Western digital markets in the context of what have been deteriorating uh, political relations between the US and China. So with those opening remarks, I now uh, throw to our first uh, presenter, uh, Victor Picard. Victor, over to you. Thank you, Terry. I'm just going to uh, get some PowerPoint slides up here. Uh, as soon as I, let's see. Shares. Uh, I thought I knew how to do this, but I'm trying to share my PowerPoint slides. And they're not coming up for some reason. No, no, I think it's coming now. Um, uh, I've been uh, deprived of the opportunity to teach via Zoom this semester since I've been on sabbatical. And uh, it means that I'm not quite as adept. Um, but I do have my, are you, are you all you seeing go. my PowerPoint? Yep. You are? Oh, excellent. Okay. Unfortunately, I just wasted a couple minutes there. Um, I was about to say that uh, I'm going to dive right into it because I'm going to try to save us a minute or two, but we'll see um, what happens. But much of what I'm discussing uh, today, I think, fits nicely with some of the things that you just brought up, Terry. Uh, I'm looking specifically at um, what might be referred to as the journalism crisis, but it, how it relates to the rise of platform monopolies. And much of what I'm about to discuss, uh, do, I, I do uh, talk about in, in my new book, Democracy Without Journalism. This is also leading me into another project. You'll soon see that much of what I'm discussing here about the structural roots of the journalism crisis and what's to be done about it are still fairly broad uh, brush strokes um, where I'm arguing that the crisis is also an opportunity to create a new uh, media system, a, rare, a, a fairly ambitious plan, uh, but I hope to put some more flesh on those bones in my uh, next project. And I should say up front, um, as I always do, that uh, much of this work focuses on the uh, US scenario, but I'm also always careful to, sh to say that this is by no means suggesting that we should be uh, emulating the uh, American policy landscape. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. I'm arguing that the US is a case study or a cautionary tale of what not to do, uh, especially with regards to the journalism crisis and how we might uh, regulate the uh, platform monopolies. Um, but also, I would argue, and I think this is increasingly clear, that what we used to think of as the American journalism crisis is increasingly a global journalism crisis. And more specifically, democratic countries around the world uh, right now are grappling with this problem where they are losing their local journalism. This is true before the pandemic, but certainly uh, post uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, we're seeing a, a, a magnification of this structural crisis for journalism. Now, what do I mean by the journalism crisis? We all have a, a general sense of, of what this is, but there are a couple of nuances here that I want to underscore. Um, obviously, uh, the root really goes to the collapse of the advertising dependent business model, and this is now irreparably broken, but this wasn't simply broken by the internet, it wasn't even necessarily broken by uh, Google and Facebook. I would argue it goes back to the dawn of the commercialization of the press um, when uh, journalism first became so dependent on advertising revenue in the US, rather, I, I would say US and Canada and North America, um, the uh, breakdown has historically been about 80, 20, 80% of the revenues coming from advertising, 20% coming from readers. This also goes far to explain why the journalism crisis hit earlier and harder in the US compared to other uh, democratic countries. But basically what happened is that when readers and advertisers migrated to the web where digital advertising pays pennies to the dollar of traditional print advertising, this is when the business model completely uh, came apart. And of course, most of that revenue, that digital advertising revenue, is going to the big bad duopoly, Google and Facebook, which I'll return to momentarily. So 
Loss of advertising revenue means fewer journalists, newspapers are closing, declaring bankruptcy, going online only. Uh, to just mention one extreme example, the Cleveland Plain Dealer 20 years ago had about 340 news workers. Today it has four. Um, even before the pandemic uh, struck in the US, newsrooms had been reduced by well over 50% since the early 2000s. Um, so this was already a major problem. We were already losing local journalism. And now with the pandemic, which is obviously not a cause, but an accelerant uh, of this crisis, things are, are getting quite uh, dire. And again, this, we're seeing this in countries around, around the globe, not just the U.S. So with the rise of uh, news deserts, it's a tremendous systemic market failure. Um, hundreds of, of newspapers have closed, hundreds of communities lack any access to new, local news media whatsoever, and yet there's been almost no public policy response in the U.S. Uh, in addition to that, and, and this is an argument I used to have to really fight over uh, at length, but increasingly I think people are almost bored by the observation, but I'll say it anyway. Um, there is no commercial solution to the local journalism crisis. The advertising revenue is not coming back. It's it, all newspapers in, in the US and increasingly around the world are uh, suffering, are, 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 are falling apart due to this reliance on a commercial model, except for the very big national papers in the US, you've got the big three, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. You also might have some small niche outlets, perhaps membership models, but by and large, the newspaper industry um, is reaching a point of no return. So we have to find non-commercial alternatives. Now, in many countries around the world, uh, an intuitive uh, alternative would be a public media system. Uh, and most democratic societies have strong public media systems. I always trot out this graph whenever I'm talking about these issues because it shows so dramatically how the U.S. is almost literally off the chart for how little it allocates towards its public media system per person per year. It comes out to about $1.35, so a cheap cup of coffee. Compare that to Japan, just getting close to $50 per person per year. Here in the UK, it's about $100 per person per year that they pay for the BBC. In Norway, you get up to almost $200. Why this matters is because when, there, when the market fails to support the level of journalism a democracy requires, at least with the strong public media system, you have a social safety net um, to try to cover some of those gaps uh, left by the commercial system. In the U.S., we don't have that. We have the worst of both worlds with the commercial model collapsing and no public um, alternative to, to take its place. So this is where increasingly you're hearing people uh, blame Facebook and Google for the journalism crisis. And I would be the first person to say that the duopoly is certainly complicit. They have exacerbated the journalism crisis, but they have not caused it. If we remember what I was describing earlier, that's a much, it's a much more fundamental breakdown in the core business model for journalism. Um, now, Facebook and Google do take almost 70% uh, of, of digital advertising revenue uh, in the US. This is, sh this is beginning to change and Amazon is climbing up there, but still we're talking about a, a duopoly in most, uh, most cases. And of course they profit from the very same news content that they're ev eviscerating all the, all the while amplifying misinformation, disinformation, causing all kinds of negative externalities and social harms. Um, so there's a sort of intuitive sense of justice if we we're to blame uh, the duopoly for this. Another thing they do that I, I feel doesn't get enough attention is that they, in very subtle but significant ways, restructure journalistic routines that have a direct impact on content. So in other words, and I get this a lot from, the inter from interviews with journalists, that they have internalized a logic. Whenever they're crafting a news story, they're thinking about how will this play on Facebook? How can I make sure this will get lots of likes and shares? Or or not necessarily likes, uh, hates are fine too, as long as there's engagement um, with, with the uh, news story. So it has, uh, you might say it encourages a kind of clickbait um, journalism. Now, at the same time, um, what's interesting on the political front in the US over the last few years has been a rise of an anti-monopoly movement um, that generally breaks down into three paradigms. One might be referred to as the Jeffersonian or Neo-Brandeisian, uh, movement. This is associated with the Open Markets Institute, Elizabeth Warren as well as often uh, part, part of this school, um, which uh, basically 
uh, calls for breaking up the monopolies, calling for you know, antitrust interventions, more competition will solve uh, many of our problems. Big is bad or the curse of bigness, which is a quote from Brandeis himself and also the title of Tim Wu's uh, newish book that's kind of the, the, uh, the, 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 the text that's, that really embodies this criticism. Now the foil of the Jeffersonian movement is the ha what might be called the Hamiltonian movement. And I'll confess up front that I don't think I've ever actually met a Hamiltonian, um, but supposedly they are out there. Um, it roughly maps on to the regulated monopoly school. So the idea that um, big is not necessarily bad, it can be good. Not only might it confer uh, efficiencies and other benefits uh, to consumers, uh, but also when you're dealing with one centralized player, it's easier to regulate, it's easier to unionize uh, that industry. Um, so uh, that there, there's even a progressive uh, argument for uh, for this idea that maybe monopolies aren't necessarily bad, or in some cases you might have natural monopolies, or you have network effects that call for uh, having one centralized uh, network, one major player. Now there's a third school um, that I've pretty much invented, <laughs> but uh, I think it somewhat captures um, a, a broader critique that doesn't fit into these other two, you might call it social democratic or, or even socialist. It's probably on the, on the socialist spectrum. But the idea that not all these problems that we're talking about are monopoly problems. Some of them are capitalism problems. For example, surveillance capitalism will not go away if we simply break up uh, Facebook, even though that often sounds like the radical argument in the room. We're talking about smashing up the monopolies, which I'll, I'll, I'll say up front, I'm, I'm very much in favor of in many cases. Uh, but I don't think that's going to solve our problems. It's certainly not going to solve the journalism crisis. And uh, this is where I think we, might, we need to start thinking in terms of removing things from the market or creating public alternatives, public options, or to try to introduce public logics into this otherwise very commercialized uh, system. So this is where uh, in my work I'm calling for creating a public media fund and this is another important nuance that I feel like it's getting left out of a lot of the discussions. Um, this increasingly you're hearing uh, for uh, you're, you're hearing for uh, interventions that force the duopoly to better distribute advertising revenue to do it in a more uh, you know, egalitarian fashion where they're sending money back to the commercial publishers. This is a proposal uh, that's gaining traction in Australia right now, many countries around the world. I just just today I heard that Ireland uh, that journalists in Ireland are pushing for this. In the U.S., this has been one of the main policy proposals uh, pr fronted, uh, put forth. And uh, I'm arguing for not putting that money back towards the commercial players that in many ways uh, helped create the journalism crisis in the first place. Um, I'm arguing for putting that money into a public media fund. So in some countries that might go towards an already existing public broadcasting system, or it might go into something um, different. Now, ideally, this money would not be reliant on the platforms. I actually call for it coming straight out of the U.S. Treasury, but if we are going to have to find external means of paying for it, different revenue streams, uh, the duopoly could be one of these revenue streams along with some, of, some perhaps foundations or taxes on other types of monopoly, taxes on uh, devices, for example. There are many different ways that we could generate this money. Now, I'm calling for $30 billion, which is basically pocket change when we're thinking about the $2 trillion uh, bailout uh, stimulus package that just came down. Now, I, I'm going to spare you on some of the details where I'm talking about how we would democratize this fund and make sure it's not uh, captured. But at the end of the day, uh, I think there are two important points. One is that this money has to be allocated towards news deserts and towards the communities that are most impacted by uh, the pandemic crisis, but also by the, just the journalism crisis uh, in general that, that preceded the uh, pandemic, but also that at the end of the day, the point is to reinvent journalism, to not just decommercialize it, but democratize it. And uh, that's where uh, I keep coming down, you, despite all of these depressing uh, doom and gloom narratives, I'm weirdly optimistic. Uh, perhaps it's because of just the abundance of evidence of market failure all around us, but I think that especially among young people today, they're much less enthralled to market fundamentalism. We're going to be seeking out innovative uh, experiments in the years to come. The question, of course, is how bad things have to become first, 
uh, but I'm going to try to end on a positive note. So I do think the crisis is an opportunity for creating something better. Thank you very much. I'll end there. So I'm not sure what the protocol is. Uh, Terry, shall I try to put up my screen? For Victor, some reason, we're, I... not, we're not hearing Terry, right? right. No. OK. Because it looks like Terry's talking, but I'm not hearing him. Victor, I can't put my screen up till yours is done. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm a newbie completely, and I was teaching, so um, let's use the chat and let him know we can't hear him. Am I go? Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Victor. That was um, um, that was really interesting, and I am going to be picking up on some of the themes that uh, Terry introduced in his opening, particularly around governance. Um, and I was uh, with the reminder that his project is starting with where things were in the 2010s and. My starting point is that, um, as is so often the case, that what we experience as new kinds of legal issues, and that are often new kinds of legal issues, um, uh, doesn't, uh, even though they're new, doesn't mean that we can't learn a lot from the past to help us think about them. Uh, so I'm at the beginning of a, kind of a massive project. Uh, the question is, what existing information policy provides precedence for governance of and by algorithms by either the public or the private sector. Um, and what I'm focusing on is the question of how and why does the law distinguish among types of information processing for purposes of differential legal treatment. One of the thrills of this project for me, I have to say, is that it allows me to make use again of work that I have done for over 35 years to make secondary uses out of previous research. And so for those who ever watch this or hear this presentation um, who are younger, um, I think one of the things we never talk about when we socialize uh, thinkers, academic scholars, is the way in which our experience of research changes over time. And so this is a kind of project that I couldn't have taken, I don't think, earlier uh, in my career. For those of you who know my book, Change of State, I wanted to place this project relative to that one. It's actually equal in scale, but it's the inverse. Um, so the starting point in Change of State, uh, which looks at 32 different areas of the law for, um, for what it, how our decisions about information policy are affecting us. Um, uh, this project, Algorithms and Governance, starts from information processing, not the law as it, as it deals with information processing, but information processing itself. Change of state, uh, theorized governance, but analyzed only government. This project mines government for framework and toolkit for governance. So um, it's turning the other one uh, inside out. This is what I'm going to run through rather quickly today, just to introduce you to the mode of thinking and some examples of what, um, of what kinds of things I'm looking for. Uh, starting with definitions, um, that really all we mean by an algorithm, we're accustomed to the mathematical definitions, but it really just means a procedure for doing things in a systematic manner in order to accomplish a particular task. Here's some various versions of that. But with this definition, um, which is well supported, we can think of our individual and social routines as algorithms as well. 
uh, information policy. Uh, I use a very broad definition of uh, laws and policies governing any form of information creation, processing, flows, and use. So that includes platform regulation. And it's important for this project to recognize that it, um, it appears at the intersections among uh, interactions and intersections among social information and technological systems. So it is inherently social technical as well as social legal. When it comes to governance as distinct from government, uh, we're talking about formal and informal uh, rules, decision-making processes and venues, venues, implementation programs of both the public and the private sectors. So uh, it, it, information policy um, is governance that includes what is done by geopolitically uh, recognized governments, but goes well beyond. So that includes all of our social media platforms and other kinds of platforms that are at the focus of uh, Terry and his group's project. Um, a brief history, the word was coined in the 19th, algorithm was coined in the ninth century, but of course referred to much older practices. Problems from removing humans in the loop what became evident as early as railroad regulation of the 1890s. It was actually our old friend Norbert Wiener who first uh, conceptualized communication processes as mathematical 28 years before we get Shannon. Um, interestingly enough, although the word algorithm was very old, it didn't receive definitions until the 1930s when so many people began arguing over limits on its use and that was in the course of things like uh, what's a market basket uh, for purposes of consumer price index and things like that. Uh, in 1952, and I am going to use the US as a case because it's the case I know the best and there, uh, it has certainly had an influence globally, historically. Um, in 1952, the U.S. changed the word art in patent law to uh, uh, replace it with the word process, making it possible to patent algorithms, which has enormous consequences. You can own, you can restrict and control social processes, and it means that the proprietary nature of algorithms makes technological due process impossible. By the 1970s, uh, constitutional scholar uh, Lawrence Tribe of importance under <laughs> with our current presidential administration as well, again. Um, any information processing affecting relations within and among individuals, groups, or entities by definition is constitutional in nature. So all of, the, our, um, all of the kinds of questions we address when we think about governance and algorithms would be, um, I follow a tribe on this, constitutional and constitutive in nature. By the 18s and uh, 1980s and 90s, we get theorization of the constitutive effects of computer programs. I forgot to start my timer, but I'm now worried about time, so I'm not going to talk you through uh, each of these. But um, I think what's worth uh, noting here is that we get similar kinds of insights coming from what were at least at the time seen as very different worlds of thought, whether it was legal theory from a mainstream guy, actually like Lessig or a French postmodernist like Baudrillard. Uh, in the 21st century, um, I think we, we often forget, but we need to remember that it was the UN Security Council that mandated very specific kinds of information processing uh, required of every nation state in the world for uh, anti-terrorism purposes. And I've published on that if people want more detail on that. Um, we're just, we began distinguishing among um, changes in the nature of power and new forms of power in the 21st century. Um, a succinct summary of my own contributions here, and I think Masumi is quite profound uh, in many ways when he talks about relationships between ontology and epistemology in this era. So the two methods that I want to use to mine existing law for ways of thinking about information processing and differentially treating, distinguishing among kinds of information processing for purposes of differential legal treatment um, uh, our first secondary analysis of existing research findings through this frame, and then primary research on constitutional law. Um, so a few examples, we've got 21 different information policy principles in the US Constitution, each one protecting a different type of information processing. Our distinctions among kinds of telecommunications regulation fall in this category at a kind of macro level. Um, we can see interesting examples of the same principle across different legal silos. So the, the, I think this is a really fascinating example. Um, am I blocking my slides with where the images are on the screen? 
um, uh, forbidding information processing. So it, you get at this in libel law where you get protected with the neutral reportage defense if you don't process information. You get it in the world of prior restraint with the government's argument that you have the right to access information in the public domain, but not to bring different pieces of information together and think about it. And we get it in the world of privacy where we have mo mosaic analysis now that is saying that bringing together pieces of information that are in the public and accessible and harmless in themselves, but if you bring them together, that can make it uh, illegal. Um, we see uh, examples of the same principle across different practices. An example, no invasion of privacy if there's no human in the loop. We see the US National Security Agency's uh, position on this. There's no uh, private communications, no invasion of our communications privacy until a human, an employee, reads them. Uh, same thing, Google's defense in lawsuits. Algorithms don't invade privacy because they're only looking at computers, not at humans. Um, I just wanted to highlight here, this is an example of a major theoretical shift from thinking in terms of, of panopticon, every uh, surveillance focused on a subject to a pan spectrum based analysis of, of surveillance where no one appears until a question is asked, a very different uh, uh, paradigm. Um, examples of secondary readings, this is work, these are examples of work that I did in the past that I realized can be um, uh, very useful in building a framework for thinking about governance of and by algorithms. Uh, an example at the national level are open meeting laws. In 1984, I analyzed all of our state 50 open meeting laws and found 23 different indicators of openness. Um, distinguished them, uh, each one referring to a different type of information processing, each with different kinds of arguments for yay or nay and how to handle these kinds of things. That means you can build, um, and I did build, a spectrum of relative openness across the states with significant differences in actual access. They all had open meeting laws, but what they really meant was very different because of how information processing was treated. I'm currently updating that um, so we can have a longitudinal comparison. An example from the international realm uh, comes, uh, it's, uh, comes from research I did that was um, in 90 and 91 uh, that looked at information policy and arms control treaties. Uh, I looked at all arms control treaties from the first uh, one at the beginning of the 20th century through 1989 when the ostensible uh, collapse of the Soviet Union uh, brought discussion of that to a close for a period. There were 25 different kinds of information policy provisions included uh, in these uh, six categories. I, I don't need to read them out to you. Um, but again, each one of these had different arguments. They were distinguishing because they need a differential treatment. And each one of these then would generate, you'd start with one sentence in a treaty. And by the time you're done with it, you've got a 300 page manual detailing, for example, how reporters are supposed to be part of observation teams and rules very specifically about that. Uh, in terms of primary research, I'm looking at constitutional law uh, and algorithms, information processing. This was actually um, something that I became aware of inductively in the course of my dissertation research, which looked at decisions 18, 1980 and 1986. Uh, general features in that period were that 10% of all cases involved information policy. There was very clear, both explicit and implicit reliance on the concept of an information production chain. So they were always distinguishing between something that was transmission versus distribution. Uh, collection versus generation and so forth. They clearly distinguish between algorithmic and cognitive information processing and in the 1988 dissertation I did use the word algorithmic. Um, information processing was consensually understood to be very powerful, but there was little consensus among justices during this period regarding how to treat various kinds of uh, information processing. Um, Uh, I, um, so uh, specific findings from that period were that procedural social processing was understood to be more powerful than technological, effects of information processing were seen as irreversible, social economic class was understood to be related to informational class, that has an article behind it, 
Um, they understood differences between potential and actual uses of informational power. And clearly there were constitutional justifications for setting different standards for different types of information agents and contexts. The example of labeling, which I looked at from the beginning through 86, uh, showed that it changed uh, in significant ways over time in ways that Baudrillard's theory of four historical stages of value explained better than anything else. Just a reminder again on the theoretical side of the uh, importance of being theoretically pluralistic when looking at uh, algorithm trends of importance. Um, in the 90s, uh, I went back and looked at this again for a TPRC paper. Uh, the concept of information injury was introduced. There was explicit discussion of how hard it was to distinguish among stages of the information production chain. Um, they re and they again, uh, this is really an important example, rejected, I, I fear that, uh, it, um, I don't know if uh, Terry's telling me I'm going on too long. I can't see that. Um, uh, that, the, that we weren't allowed to um, algorithmically treat census data to remedy problems because the constitution used the word enumeration. So I think this is a really important example of actually a problem. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but capital was recognized as an information processor. Language translations were seen to be so significant that they justify different legal treatment. Um, differences in the borders of different types of systems was legally problematic as well. In the 21st century, we're seeing both some new types of legal concerns appearing. For example, use of a technology that creates new affordances for our ability to draw inferences can itself violate the law. And we're seeing some of the earliest issues um, continue to be problematic. So I'm looking right now at the Marshall Court, 1801 to 1835, a court known to have made decisions that were very significant for the structure of US government and the balance of powers. Um, who knew what when and how, when does one know something was a frequent issue. A 2020 case again is asking, um, is, is uh, addressing the question of whether or not receipt of information means you actually have knowledge of what's in it if it, hasn't, if it isn't read or recalled. It's a who knew uh, what when kind of issue as well. So uh, what I'm doing, uh, my work in progress is looking at the entire history of US Supreme Court decisions for treatment of information processing with the goal of identifying lines of precedent and types of arguments and evidence considered valuable for distinguishing among types of information processing for differential policy treatment by either public or private sectors uh, with my current focus being algorithms and the Marshall Court. Um, it matters because uh, I believe this, these principles and arguments should be foundational for understanding governance and by algorithms. Uh, these, uh, what we do here can alter our political processes. Looking at the US case provides a foundation for making comparative analyses that clearly will exhibit cultural, social, and political differences. Uh, it makes clear that there are constitutional, principled, evaluative criteria for uh, algorithms beyond efficiency, and there are implications for network architecture and technology design, as well as for laws and policies. Um, and it identifies areas in which we have we need additional theoretical and conceptual work. Inferences is one interesting example. Um, a lot of what has happened is trying to prevent us from making unwelcome inferences on the basis of information to which we legally have the right of access. On the other hand, there's the problem of not acting on inferences um, uh, that's embedded in our legal rules. And some of what we need to think about then is regarding the nature of governance itself. It becomes a meta-governance issue. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, hi, my name is Lian Rui Jiang, and I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Toronto. So, today I'm going to present a part of my ongoing postdoc research, which looks at um, the regulation of Apple App Store in China. So um, as the mobile telecommunication uh, has become really popular and uh, rich in a wide uh, kind of geography, 
So there are emerging uh, schools that look at the role of app stores, especially in their role as infrastructural platform services. So these are uh, play an important role in terms of setting the price and terms of distributions uh, of app uh, distribution um, through their ecosystems. And also they have different standards uh, that they've made in terms of privacy governance. So the existing literatures have showed that the Apple App Store has a more detailed and well outlined definition of privacy protection versus Android um, Apple Store is more kind of uh, lax and leaves to the developer to interpret the meaning of privacy. So therefore, App Stores are a very important site of platform governance. And, and in terms of uh, economics and the platform development, they're also very important for the platform ecosystem. So for example, Apple has launched the Apple Store in 2008, which radically changes the meaning and functionality of uh, iPhone, and also kind of augmented the network effect. Okay, so um, why study China? So basically, uh, this is an overview of the status of Chinese App Store development. So as we all know that China has a very large mobile population. So even though the internet connection and penetrations through the desktop in the country is only around 60%, but almost all of the uh, population wired to the internet through mobile phones. So the, I think the penetration rate are around 96%. Okay, so therefore it makes China the largest app market in terms of number of app developers, app users and app store operators. So China surpassed uh, United States at the largest apps market in 2016. And I see also uniqueness is uh, it's one of the markets that free from the Apple Alphabet duopoly. So which means that with the withdrawal of Google in 2010 due to the controversy of uh, censorship imposed on this ser uh, search service, that Google also uh, can impact it as Android development. So therefore, it also leaves a lot of space for domestic um, companies to develop their own Android version of App Store and uh, ecosystems. Okay, so more specifically, uh, looking at the market. So the market share, um, as we can see, are dominant by a variety of different uh, kind of uh, type of companies. So of course, we have the presence of uh, BAT, so the biggest uh, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. So Tencent is ranking uh, at number one. And also we have a lot of uh, cell phone manufacturers. So the examples are Huawei, Oppo, and Xiaomi. So these app stores are usually pre-installed on the devices they sold. Okay. And we also have the participants of internet software companies or internet security companies. So this, it's seen in the 360 mobile assistance. So this is um, an internet security company. And also telecommunication operators like China Mobile also uh, joined the market as well. So in total, there are over 400 uh, Android markets that operate in China. And the revenue share is quite also uh, different from the Western uh, Apple and Google. So the norms, uh, it's uh, uh, five to five. So basically the app store takes half of the revenue that was generated through in-app purchases. And also the revenue structure is uh, featured differently in different stores. So some store has a tiered structure, which means if you own uh, or if you can have a very large revenue, then the app store will take a larger portion. So uh, five, five, or if you are up and coming, so as an incentive, they will probably waive um, the revenue sharing or reimburse some of the advertising cost. So, and also if you're really popular apps, you can also have the power to negotiate with the app store uh, in terms of this uh, profit distribution. And so far uh, among the leading market players, China Mobile, which the state owned telecommunication companies has the lowest uh, revenue share structures. And so I, I was set to um, go back to China and interview some of the de developers um, uh, more details about this because it's really, really hard to get the data and they, the Chinese term seems to be very different from the West, but I will do that uh, after the COVID situation passes. Okay, so um, more on the evolving regulation. So the Chinese states is gra gradually catching up uh, regulating these areas. So one of the uh, 
a regulation that has a key bearings on app store operators are the real name registration policy, which requires all of the apps uh, that are published uh, through their app stores have a mechanism to collect your cell phone numbers that uh, they can easily track or contact you. And the other uh, important piece of uh, recent changes in regulation is the data localization rules that uh, stipulated in China's cybersecurity law. So which requires foreign companies offering services in China, either lease servers to store uh, their user data or they have to form a joint venture with local partners. And all of the local partners are usually affiliated or state owned. So uh, Apple, as we, as we can see later, uh, kind of joined, uh, form and join winter visit domestic data service company to store their data uh, in mainland China. And, and also in 2017, uh, the Chinese government has issued the app store registration policy, which means if you're an owner and operating an app store, you have to register with the state agencies. And also you have to, you have the duty to inform if there is any changes in terms of the app store operations. Um, and also as Xi Jinping came into power, they, there is really a stepping up of uh, internet control over all sorts of internet activities. So uh, most importantly is the virtual private networks. So the government said we have to uh, register every uh, VPN that operate in the nation and we need to take down any of the kind of unregistered uh, services. And mobile games is also one of the strictly regulated areas. If you want to make money through direct commodification, which means if you wanted to have in-app purchases options, you need to have a license. Uh, but if it is free, uh, free to play apps, then it, you don't need to register. And all of the games needs to go through approval, which means that you need to give um, the government some time for it to go through the game that you developed. And they will kind of uh, have the ability to approve it or reject it. But the problem here is that uh, the government, the specific ministry only can review 20 to 30 games per month, which caused a lot of problems um, as these markets catching up really quickly. And Tencent was caught up actually. Uh, the market capitalization was dropped because of these newly uh, uh, instituted rules. And also for foreign companies, they either have to rely on domestic distribution services to distribute the apps, or they have to join a for, uh, joint venture with domestic companies. Okay, so this is uh, a lot of rules for foreign app developer to navigate. Okay, so this is a uh, study that I've done uh, with one of my colleagues to look at how well this uh, regulation has been implemented. So this is um, some of the most popular Chinese apps and we kind of compare the domestic versus the uh, international versions. And the circle here indicate the Kind of the quantity of personal data they collected. So overall, it shows that uh, Chinese apps offers two versions. Um, so the, either the global facing and the domestic facing. And so the, the, the domestic facing actually implement all of the rules that the government uh, has put forward. So especially with the real name registration, which means that it's very hard for you to remain anonymous right now on the Chinese app. So they all ask for your cell phone numbers to be registered as a user. Okay. So more specifically, why study Apple app stores? Um, so although China has a very large Android app market, the Apple is still kind of a standalone uh, foreign app store that's still available in China. And Google Play right now with the US and China trade, um, conflicts. So the Huawei phones no longer have all of the Android licensed uh, app stores on the phones. So, so, so Apple is the only one uh, kind of operating in the market. And it actually generates a lot of uh, revenues from China. So most of the most popular ones or most uh, profitable ones are the online games. Okay, so for China, it's generated roughly 40% of the app revenue for Apple's. And moreover, uh, with the lo data localization, all of the Apple uh, iCloud data hosted in mainland China. Right now. Okay, so um, 
this is kind of still a ongoing project that I look at. So I identify three kind of processes where the platform power and the state power kind of interact and interject each other. So the first key process is the Apple, uh, the app uh, review process. Okay, so previously, Apple is quite lax in terms of uh, its app review processes. So in 2018, that the state media, Xinhua, was actually openly criticized Apple's um, kind of ignorance in terms of approving a lot of the game apps. So starting 2018, 2019, that the, the state is really kind of pre pressuring Apple to enforce that every game needs to have a license and registration number. So um, here are some of the things that they have to obtain. So in order to publish their apps on Apple, so the software copyright certificate, which is, uh, will become useful when there is a copyright infringement. And for games, uh, as we, I just talked about, that you need a license uh, number. And the, the number is obtained through the soft uh, organization. So it usually take around 30, uh, 30 days period. And if you are engaging other type of apps, you usually need to apply for internet content publishing lessons. And for VPN, um, you are required a license from the MIT. So it is, uh, I, I checked the Apple development, uh, Apple developer form. So a lot of developers are very confused about the very specific uh, type of service and this required license. So there are a lot of confusions and even with a language barrier, it's very hard for them to navigate where and from which uh, organizations they need to apply for license to. And also uh, for any of the apps that published on um, Apple App Store, they need to install the real name registration policies, which means they have to have um, a step that required to, to turn in your cell phone numbers. And for games, you need to have an anti-addiction plans and measures. So I think this is um, where the state kind of intervene uh, the review uh, in the in the kind of the editorial process of app pub, app public. <laughs> So the second, okay. uh, yeah, second process is, is the app takedown. So as of 2018, uh, Apple has launched all the information for uh, government requests, and this includes uh, the apps as well. So as we can see in these two pictures that China basically, the Chinese government basically occupy all, almost all of the requests that submitted to Apple for takedowns. Okay? And mm. you can see the compliance rates are quite high actually. So, for example, there are 56 uh, that was submitted and 55 was taken down in 2018. Okay. So this is kind of the, uh, the places where censorship kind of penetrate or sipping in. And so there are a few examples. Uh, one of them was the bookstore apps back in 2013. So the government's uh, request for this apps to take down was that were published that the government think is uh, uh, harmful for their kind of social stability or uh, political okay. literacy. Yeah. And uh, Apple News was, was taken down for similar reasons and uh, New York Times. And actually all of these uh, requests was based on some of the so-called legal uh, basis. You know, they are publishing either harmful information online or um, stuff like that. So the last uh, example, the Hong Kong Map dot Live and course was actually taken down during the Hong Kong uh, demonstration around 2019 because uh, according to the Chinese government, it was kind of endangering people's uh, safety. And the, the apps were installed after. So you can see how kind of censorship also um, kind of directly intervened into Apple's uh, decisions. Okay, so this, the last uh, aspect right. I want to talk about is the commercial pressures. So this is very distinctive kind of a Chinese uh, internet culture. So on the WeChat, which is the social or super apps that every, uh, basically almost all of the internet users are familiar with. So there is a function called tipping. So if you are publishing an article and this red button here will show that if the uh, reader thinks it's really good, they can send a tip to the content creators. So for Apple, uh, it said we want 30% uh, share of whatever is you know tipped. So Tencent, in an act of resistance, 
uh, tell all of these uh, WeChat users that we're going to shut down the tipping functions. And so Tencent saying, okay, we, we're not going to uh, share the revenue between you and uh, whoever using our platforms. Um, and later on, that Apple and Tencent can reach an agreement saying that uh, if it's a tipping, all of the amount will go directly to the creators. And this rule has changed not only for China, but overall for all of the Apple developers uh, in the Apple community. So I think this is also an area where kind of commercial power or market competition can kind of help leverage some of the platform powers exerted by the, uh, the, the, uh, the big platforms in, this, in the US in the Chinese content. Okay, so I'll end quickly here. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to our uh, final final presentation, which is uh, Dwayne Winsick. So, Dwayne, over to you. And apologies right. for my microphone issues. I've sort of those now. Okay. Okay. So, Leanne Ray, you have to take your uh, PowerPoint down before I can put mine up. All right. Okay, well, um, really uh, good to see everybody here. Let me put my uh, timer on to see if I can have some uh, self-discipline here. Terry, you'll probably uh, have to give me a, a heads up. I will. Uh, I'm, I'm using the chat function for that. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll try to keep my eye uh, uh, tuned to that. And if you can just, yeah, holler at me if I go over. So anyway, here's what I want to do. I mean, as uh, Terry set up and as each one of the papers has already shown, I mean, the idea of platform regulation now is in uh, the air. Part, we've got a tech clash, we've got a voluminous uh, scholarly output uh, that's developing around this question, and we've got governments that are seized uh, with the issue. And the list that uh, Manuel Pupas and I has now grown to about 70 uh, entries long uh, in terms of the number of public inquiries that are either ongoing or that are recently included with respect to this question. I think as you go through the uh, literature, which is really a struggle to kind of keep up with, I'm seeing five kind of themes pop out. One is, of course, the, the obvious enormous market capitalization of the GAFM companies and this idea that this gives them a massive global scale that puts them into a league of their own and that this power, part of it is, allowed them to basically remake the internet in their image, the platformization of the web, as uh, Ann Hellman calls it, the shift from uh, the internet of science to the internet of entertainment, as Ellie Noam calls it. And then we start to look at how this power is playing out across the communication, media, uh, cultural industries landscape, and we see ideas that Facebook and Google dominate online advertising, while well, a handful of search engines, social media services, and content aggregation platforms dominate, dominate this increasingly platform-dependent media economy, and maybe even the broader economy uh, as a whole, begetting terms like platform capitalism, surveillance capitalism, the platform uh, society, and so on. And lastly, we get this idea that platforms are media companies, and therefore media policy should just serve as our North Star for what platform uh, regulation uh, should look like. Now, I want to respond uh, to each of these claims in five ways. And, uh, you know, basically, I want to say, you know, I think we're seeing, um, Terry, something that you pointed out to way back in 2008 in the first book, first global media book, uh, this idea of, you know, a lot of big numbers being bandied about with a proper, without a proper sense of scale. So the fallacy of big numbers, and I want to really lean into that uh, today. The second is, that these companies, they have leveraged their positions to rewire the internet for surveillance and hyper-targeted messaging. And those capabilities have been hijacked in recent years for disinformation and misinformation operations. And I really do believe that this is a problem, that it does threaten uh, personal autonomy, uh, trust and democracy. And it does put uh, other media that are dependent upon advertising on a race to the bottom uh, uh, kind of, uh, approach with respect to privacy and data protection. I think that is a really big problem. Now, as I'm gonna show in a minute, there's no doubt that Google and Facebook, uh, as uh, uh, Victor's already pointed out, dominate online advertising. And you know, there's a correlation here between this and the idea that journalism is in crisis. 
And so let's blame Google and Facebook, but I really think this is simplistic for some reasons that I'll get into. Um, moreover, and I think this is the bigger uh, message that I want to get, most media in fact are based on subscriber fees. Basically subscriber fees and all the data I'm going to present today is based on uh, the US. Um, subscriber fees outstrip advertising fees by about a three to one ratio. And most media uh, rely primarily on uh, subscriber fees and they're thriving. And when we look at the broader landscape, we see that Google and Facebook nor uh, the Gaffin Group as a whole dominate all advertising or the US media economy uh, in, uh, as a whole. The last thing I want to do is I want to put some new regulatory touchstones on the table. Uh, I want to get beyond this idea that platforms are media companies. I think this is a kind of a superficial analogy that takes part of what they do for the whole. I think if we look to telecoms, public utility, and antitrust regulation, we get a much richer link to communications history, the progressive era, and normative values, and four touchstones for platform regulation in particular, structural separation, like divestitures, firewalls, like line of business uh, restrictions or common carriage and net neutrality, public obligations, and public uh, alternatives. So, I mean, we can see, I'm gonna go through these slides pretty quickly because some of them are just obvious. Here's the market cap. There's no doubt they stand uh, in a league on their own. Let's move to the uh, idea of online advertising. And, you know, let's make sure we keep the focus. It's on online advertising. Here again, um, this is all report data from the U.S. Census Bureau and from the company's annual reports, and it's clear that Facebook and Google are in a league of their own. They dominate. There's a digital duopoly with you know, just under three quarters of all online advertising flowing to the two uh, behemoths. All right, uh, Dwayne. Dwayne, we're yeah. not seeing your we're not seeing your slides at the minute. You're not seeing my slides. No. Ah, uh, damn. That's Here. Right. Let's uh, move this up. Got okay, it. there we go. My apologies, folks. So, um, so there we are. Um, let me just get back here to, okay, um, hold on. So here, I've just uh, lost uh, something here. Okay, can you all see me still? Yeah, can you still see me and hear me? Uh, yes. yes. Okay, perfect. So here's the data for uh, the online advertising. Uh, we can see it really clear that the two, uh, Facebook and Google, stand out uh, for the scale of their dominance. Let's move on. Um, I think a really key thing here that we really have to zero in on is the extent to which an entity like Google has vertically integrated into owning its own uh, advertising technology uh, stack on both the buy and the sell side of online uh, advertising. And we're seeing other entities like Amazon, Microsoft, AT&T and Verizon trying to uh, mimic uh, them. And I think this is a really important point because they actually, they control these advertising exchanges and the audience data upon which the advertising exchanges themselves operate, they control the measuring and rating systems upon which these advertising uh, exchanges operate. Nobody in the business that I've been talking to is happy with this. They talk about a dirty web based on fraud and deception and kind of a buyer beware um, all the way through, okay? And they've been a target of a scathing report from the United Kingdom's Information and Communication, uh, our commissioner, Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, saying basically they've got six months to clean up their act and then the ICO will decide how to regulate, uh, not if they will regulate. And I think this is, you know, this kind of rewiring of online advertising through this vertical integration and control over the data and so on. This is basically begot a kind of a Frankenstein internet that's been hijacked for disinformation and misinformation operations uh, around the world that now threaten uh, democracy uh, itself. So here's where we have a real problem. It seems to me that if we were to target a kind of structural regulation aimed at forcing divestiture or at least firewalls uh, between uh, the uh, operations of, face of Google and Facebook and their control over these advertising exchanges, we'd go a long way towards things. 
Here's where I start to think that the uh, claims start to go off the rail. And I think we find it typified in the work of people like uh, uh, Jonathan Kaplan, uh, who in Make Fa Move Fast, Break Things, talks about $50 billion per year being moved from the uh, creators of content to the owners of monopoly platforms. There's a couple of the points that he puts out. Newspaper advertising down, recorded music down by billions, home video down by billions. And my concern is that increasingly communication media scholars are accepting uh, these claims at face value. And I really think that they are fundamentally uh, misleading. They're partial at best and just wrong uh, at, uh, at worst. And I think we can start to see this by opening up the lens a little bit wider. And let's look at their influence over all advertising. That is advertising, not just online, but through television, newspapers, magazines, radio, billboards, and so on. And we see that by any normal standards of concentration, they don't really uh, meet the mark. Of course, they have a very significant presence, the two biggest players now, and there's nothing to sneeze at with Google's uh, share of a quarter of the market. But this does not pass the normal standards of market concentration. Now let's move on to the idea that you know they're causing uh, or destroying other media. I think, and this is uh, uh, Victor's focus, so I'm not going to go here too long. But I think what we really need to look at here is, you know, look at circulation. Circulation peaks back in in kind of the early 1980s, plateaus for the decade, and then starts to fall off long before the internet, let alone the platforms, uh, gain salience. Then we look at revenue and we see that it too peaks around 2000, gets sent down by the dot-com crash. And then um, we see it um, just continue to plummet after the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. I think there's a lot of contributing causes uh, here, self-inflicted wounds from uh, excessive consolidation and bloated debts. The financial crises are something that we really have to pay much more attention to. And the next points I think are absolutely key. And Terry, you're gonna have to speak up if, and just let me know how many minutes, because I can't really see the chat uh, or the messages in chat. Oh, it's okay. two minutes, two minutes at the moment. Okay, so uh, please be gracious and give me two in a little bit, but just yank me when ready. But anyway, I think, take a look at this here. And the basic point I wanna get here is, Look at the stagnation in advertising dollars on a per capita basis in the US. Basically for 20 years, advertising has stagnated at the same time that online advertising has exploded. Of course, you know when the advertising pie stays fixed, but the number of media players multiplies, this is going to really intensify the conflict between established players and new players, right? And I think that's what's really happening here and we need to pay attention to this. The bigger point that I wanna make here too though is about uh, subscriber fees, outstripping advertising fees by a three to one ratio. That's what we get uh, right here. And when we look at these, you know, we bring in all these media, we see that, look, there is no systemic crisis for the media, right? This is just the content media. If we bring in the connectivity media, the picture is even brighter. There is no crisis of communications. Let's go on here. Um, if we look, here's some figures on GAFM's total control or influence across the US media economy. Basically, collectively, they have about a 10% stake in all of the services in which they operate, uh, not including devices. Okay, so that's their number uh, down there, all right? And here we go laying them out, the top 20 players in the US. And of course, I mean, Google's a very significant player in the top four, uh, Facebook is as well. But look, they're not nearly the behemoths that they're often made out to be. I'll quickly go through here some, some lessons. One, media development has been really closely related to much larger technology, telecommunication, uh, electrical and banking sectors for the last 150 years. I think we're seeing a contemporary uh, manifestation of that today, but in this time with the digital platforms filling in. The whole history of communication and media regulation in North America, and I think in Europe, uh, in capitalist democracies, is inseparable from the history of anti-monopoly anti uh, histories and antitrust. And here's a uh, long list. 
going back from the turn of the 20th century to the 21st century. The next lesson is let's not mistake the part for the whole. I mean, AT&T was very much into broadcasting and the film industries in the 1920s and 1930s, but nobody ever said that AT&T was a broadcaster or a film company. All right, and I think that's what we need to think about when we look at the platforms. Quickly going on here, there's a lot of great lessons that come from this history of telecoms, public utility, and antitrust uh, regulation. Um, four key things, divestiture breakups, structural separation, public obligations, public ownership. There's our key tools. And I'm just about done here. Um, I don't believe that media policy has a monopoly and normative values, politics, and power. That's very much uh, embedded in telecoms uh, uh, regulation from obligations to serve, universal service, non-discrimination between end users, common carriage, interconnection, interoperability, strong privacy and data protection uh, rules. This is a really robust toolkit. Um, and I think what I'll do is, you know, I will stop uh, here. Thank you very much uh, for being generous with the time, uh, Terry and everybody else. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. I want to just um, throw to what I think is a, is a question that follows from the last presentation. I might throw it to Victor first, because uh, what, what's been thrown up here, and it's, it's by no means a hypothetical question, it's very much what we're debating in Australia right now. Uh, do digi are digital plat is the rise of digital platforms connected to the crisis of journalism and do digital plat is is there a policy should there be a policy mechanism whereby there's a transfer of revenues from digital platforms to uh, particularly news media companies hmm. yes and no so this is exactly the nuance I was trying to get at before which is and, and this complicates, I, Dwayne and I are often on the same panel and talking about similar things <laughs> it's been going on for several years now. And, and so I've seen uh, versions of his argument before. And, and he and I are actually, for, for a while there, I think Dwayne thought he was arguing against my position, but I actually think we agree more than we disagree. Um, I, I don't think that the, I was trying to make that clear, I don't think the duopoly uh, is is the main cause of the journalism crisis. So we have to be very careful because if you do think they're the main cause, which is especially from the open markets uh, folks and others, uh, part of their narrative, um, then you're going to say exactly what you just 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 asked, Terry, which is, you know, should they just give money back to the publishers and that's going to solve the problem? Well, that's not how I'm, I'm framing it. I'm framing it as a broader set of negative externalities. They're causing all kinds of harms. And I think one of the things they could be doing um, to offset some of those externalities is to put money into a public media mm -hmm. fund, not back to the commercial players. And one last tiny point is that there is a systemic crisis, uh, Dwayne, but it's, it's about, it's, it's for the news media, it's for journalism. It's not, I mean, if you throw in all those other media, then you reach your broader conclusion, which I totally agree with. But that's not what the concern is. The concern is around journalism, around news media. And that's, what the, that's where there is a systemic crisis. So we have to figure out a way to pay for that. And I think the platforms are culpable for a whole set of negative externalities. Um, and that's why I do advocate that it should go into a fund, but not back to the commercial publishers. And I know that's what Australia is trying to do is to come up with a code right now and if we have to go that route, the best thing we could do is try to weight that code towards independence mm -hmm. and include nonprofits and focus on local journalism, not go back to Rupert Murdoch. Yeah, I was going to say the politics of it are tricky because people may have an issue with Mark Zuckerberg, but they certainly also have an issue with Rupert Murdoch. Dwayne, did you want to comment on uh, Victor's observations there? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Victor's right. We have... Uh, gone over this stuff many, many times, and it's good that we have because it does help to uh, open up the shared space uh, between us and so on. So I think that's really good and, um, you know, that, that's helpful. The a couple of points, you know, what's going on in Australia and uh, uh, France um, and this idea that regulating terms of trade, if that is to mean something 
more than just siphoning off revenue and giving it to the press, I think that could be a good thing. And by that, I mean, look, if they're going to say, let's look at dominant market power, let's open up mm -hmm. uh, this vertical integration to the digital exchange and see the way in which control over the digital advertising exchange and monopoly power is leading to a bad deal for publishers. I think that's a really important uh, thing. Um, you know, but if it's just diverting cash uh, to the publishers, which is really what publishers here in Canada want, and I think most around the world mm -hmm. want, um, I don't think that that's a, a good thing at all. The last thing I'd say on that is, you know, we see in Taplin's work and we see in many uh, people's work and we see amongst the regulated communication and cultural industries here in Canada that they don't see this as a crisis just limited to uh, news. They see it as a systems-wide crisis in which the sky is allegedly falling and why the policy apparatus needs to be retooled around uh, controlling uh, the digital behemoths. And that came out uh, in the Broadcasting Telecommunication Legislative Review Panel here in Canada's report in February, which is a really defensive uh, document, despite having a lot of actually kind of good things in it. Mm, thank you. Could I throw a question to Lenroy and then to Sandra? Firstly, to Yamroy, uh, with the growing geopolitical tensions between uh, the US and China, could you say something about how this may impact upon Apple, given that it is such a prominent player in China, not just in terms of the production end, but as your paper indicated, very much in terms of its global revenue? set up? Yeah, I think definitely um, Apple is trying to still uh, kind of operate um, in China. That's given the instances that Google has not made any successful headways. So um, there's also statistics showing that Apple's uh, phone, cell, phone cells are um, dropping. So that's why uh, Apple has adopted a more kind of flexible stance in terms of uh, negotiating uh, the terms with domestic market players. And also I think with the uh, ban on Huawei, I think it's also probably an opportunity for uh, domestic Chinese kind of Android uh, developers to kind of uh, find a way to form alliances with each other in terms of, uh, I think Huawei, because of ability of not uh, Kind of, they have to go on their own to develop their uh, Android system. So they recently formed a global, I think global developer alliances with four of the mm. mobile phone uh, manufacturers. So the four company together ships around forty percent of all the cell phones that uh, they sell each year uh, around the globe. So I think uh, it might be a problem, uh, a opportunity for um, kind of the existing duopolies to. Uh, take shape a little bit. Thank you. And I wanted to uh, conclude with a question to Sandra, and it uh, comes up in the context of uh, COVID-19. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing is the uh, digital platform companies increasingly either being asked or offering themselves as the providers of uh, public utilities. And an example of this is the discussion about contact tracing apps. And broadly speaking, two models are, are emerging there. One is uh, those developed by governments, and the other is uh, an, an app that's offered by Google and Apple. Uh, do you have any sense of whether there's a sort of, when, when um, Victor was talking about a Hamiltonian model, I, I haven't heard people call themselves Hamiltonians, but the word corporatist came to mind here. And they're the quote from the Microsoft CEO that this marks a new era of partnership between business and government, I think is, is interesting that, you know, it's the argument that the fact that we're big is good because you know exactly who to work, work with on these things. Did you want to comment on, on that in terms of your, your historical analysis and your legal analysis? Yeah, here I think it's more a contemporary political analysis than anything um, about the history of the law that in this, uh, in the current context in the United States that um, 
it's hard to tell what even exists as uh, public, you know, as governmental activities mm. and interests because um, that has, uh, to such a large extent, been captured by private interests um, from the top on down. So that's where I would start an analysis. Like, I, you know, it's sort of, do we, do we want Microsoft or, or um, you know, or uh, Google to be heading a contact tracing endeavor? Or do we want Jared Kushner to be heading a contact <laughs> tracing endeavor? But both of those have to do with the private sector. Mm. Uh, Victor, was there anything you wanted to comment on with regards to that that question about COVID nineteen and where it sits in terms of your your analysis? Yeah, well, yeah, I agree with what Sandra just said, and that was also terrifying. The last thing you said uh, about Kushner, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't. I mean, it's a broader conversation about what's changing now. I think that'd be a really interesting panel that we could have tomorrow about <laughs> how much more analysis changes with with the current pandemic crisis you know but i think a lot of things are changing or becoming magnified um but uh but yeah so to be continued on that on that conversation indeed one of the things about the zoom format is we could meet as often as all of us want to and uh, continue to have <laughs> as many many discussions as we wish but at this point just to just to advise that uh this presentation will now go onto the vfairs uh platform and we'll be uh, publicly available from May 21, and then there'll be a period of comment around it. So um, please have a look at the platform because there'll be quite a bit of uh, Q&A will be generated around that. And uh, at this point, thank you all very much for, for your time and for such excellent presentations. And we look forward to the discussion and certainly also look forward to uh, meeting up again soon. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Thanks for putting it okay. together, Terry. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.